Hi friends! Today we are going to be talking about writing poetry. So before college I had never really written poetry or even been interested in writing poetry, but then in order to fulfill the creative writing requirements for the minor in my degree, I had to take classes in two of the three main forms of creative writing. Those being fiction, poetry, or creative nonfiction. And I really didn't have an interest in creative nonfiction, so I picked poetry. And in my first class, I was mega intimidated. I hadn't written poems since like eighth grade. I felt like all my sentences were so clunky and prose-like that I would never make it as a poet. But actually, being forced to write a poem a week in that class, I ended up realizing that I really, really love poetry. It's such a different form of writing than writing fiction. And it refills this creative part of your brain that doesn't always get the most attention when you're writing fiction. Since college, I've had a couple of poems published, and I will link those down below if you want to check them out. So today, I'm going to give you some tips that really help me when I'm writing poems. And I'm hoping these will be helpful for you, whether you're just starting out writing poetry, or you've already written some poems and you just need a little bit of extra inspiration. So tip number one, use concrete words instead of abstract words. Abstract words include happiness, fear, love, freedom, stress, luxury, beauty, grief, or honesty. You want to use tangible, concrete words that you can hold and interact with, rather than words that only represent a concept. That way your reader can really see and touch your poem, and it will exist in a tactile place in their brain, which is much more memorable than a poem that only uses conceptual or abstract language, where there's no real way to grasp or hold it, so there's no way to store it in your brain as a memory. Your brain can't interact with it in a physical way, so it'll have a much harder time remembering and processing it. Tip number two, aim for emotional honesty rather than journalistic truth. A great example of this is Taylor Swift's Folklore Evermore era. For those albums, she drew heavily on the emotional experience of separating from her label, but the songs themselves took that emotion and turned them into stories or imagery of divorce or the end of relationships, which was really, really interesting and much more relatable to the general public than songs about separating from a music label. And that's what poetry is really for, to draw on your own known experienced emotions and then convey them in some small image or story that might not have anything to do with your real life or the exact scenario you were in when you experienced experienced those emotions, but the poem still contains a universal truth in the form of the emotion. So when writing poetry, try to mine your own emotions and draw upon emotions that you've fully experienced, even when describing fictional or unknown events in the poem itself. Tip number three, use the entire poem to paint one singular image. For example, instead of writing a poem that spans an entire afternoon, you might write a poem that solely focuses on calling your child in for dinner from the backyard. That singular moment. You might think there's much more to talk about in a poem covering the events of an entire day, but unlike a prose story, a poem typically has one emotional beat, unless it's an unusually long or epic poem. A poem captures one specific emotional moment, rather than briefly touching on several different emotional moments, like you would find in a prose piece. Tip number four. End on a turning point. Use the last line of your poem to capture a moment of change. The last line of your poem should always carry a gut punch. That's what you leave your reader with. The whole poem builds to it, and it should carry most of the poem's emotional weight. A good way to achieve this is by having a moment of change in the final line of the poem. Either a surprising tone shift, or a contrasting image, or anything really. Just a change in the final line will make your reader perk up and pay attention. Don't let your poem fizzle out at the end. Tip number five. It's not necessary to focus only on negative emotions or experiences in poetry. I think that's the initial instinct for a lot of new poets. For example, you might gravitate towards writing a breakup song rather than a song about being in love. The negative emotions just tend to lend themselves more readily to being captured by a poem. But one of my favorite poems ever is this perfectly happy content poem that's called The Orange. I'll link it below, but I'm also going to read it as an example of a positive emotional experience in a poem. The Orange by Wendy Cope. At lunchtime, I bought a huge orange. The size of it made us all laugh. I peeled it and shared it with Robert and Dave. They got quarters and I got a half. And that orange, it made me so happy, as ordinary things often do. Just lately, the shopping, a walk into the park. This is peace and contentment. It's new. The rest of the day was quite easy. I did all the jobs on my list and enjoyed them and had some time over. I love you. I'm glad I exist. Isn't that a beautiful poem? I just love it. I love it so much. Tip number six. You don't have to rhyme. There was rhyming in the poem I just read, but when you're just starting out writing poetry, it can be a good practice to force yourself not to rhyme so that you can play around with finding lyricism and melody in language 
without relying on rhyme. This is especially helpful if the reason you're trying to write poetry is to help develop stronger prose skills. Because lyrical prose is gorgeous and memorable, but it can also be really difficult to achieve. And in a novel, you don't have the luxury of ending sentences with words that rhyme. That would probably be a little bit weird. So in your poems, play with internal rhyme, words with different inflections or emphasis on different syllables to create a rhythm, or even just use really specific, unique language that paints a memorable image in your reader's mind. That can come across as extremely lyrical, even though the words themselves don't have a rhyme scheme or lyrical pattern to it at all. Tip number seven. In a similar vein, as a beginner poet, it can be good to write the first draft of your poem without line breaks, and then add the line breaks once you feel like the poem is complete. So just write using sentences the way you would write a story, or in a block format, until you're ready to play with line breaks. This can help prevent you from falling into a limerick-style beat structure. You know, there once was a girl named Sally who lived in a verdant valley, that kind of thing. Unless that's what you're going for, it can start to creep into your poems without you even really noticing it, especially if you try to break your poems into lines while you're writing it, like while you're writing the first draft of the poem, and you're trying to break your lines in what feels like the appropriate poetic place. Plus, saving the line breaks for later allows you to really think about where you want your line breaks to go, where you want to create pause and breath and white space, which is really unique to poetry as a form. It isn't a technique that's typically available to prose writers. For example, I'll share some lines from a poem that I had published. This is a poem about gun violence. But don't tell people that you won't have children in this country out of fear that you'll lose them in a shivering pile on the cafeteria floor before they're even old enough to subtract. The white space between old enough and to subtract gives extra weight to both halves of the sentence that wouldn't necessarily be there if they were all on the same line. Old enough is intended to force the reader to think about whether children are ever really old enough to be lost, and then putting to subtract on a new line draws attention both to the fact that children are very very young when they learn to subtract, and within the context of the poem, it's almost as if they are learning to subtract themselves. So that was heavy, but tip number eight. Let yourself play with poetry as purely sound, without requiring true meaning. This is really fun, and it was one of my favorite ways to play with poetry and language when I first started writing poems. I didn't even really think of it as something that was possible before poetry classes in college. And it's actually a big part of the reason why I ended up falling in love with poetry as a whole. The idea that your poem does not have to make logical sense for it to still be a poem. You can play with the language in a purely lyrical way that you would never be able to get away with in a story with prose. And then, in this sort of sound play, I would often find myself creating tonal images or poems that end up having some level of meaning that comes purely from sound play. Here is an example. These are the first few lines from a poem I wrote in college where I was playing with sound as the focus, rather than storytelling or imagery. Slick. The sharp cavern at the edge of the moon lingers. Gray and gray and loud, other people's eardrums patter on my skin, wet, preform words wasted. That was a play of white space and melody, and totally kind of forms an image on its own. It was just really fun to write. That poem goes on for like a page and a half, and it's just playful, tonal sound play. Just pure sound play. Let yourself play with language as more than simple meaning and definition. Use poetry to find the music of language. 